Hello, everybody. This is John Leake uh, conducting our first interview for the Kennedy Beacon Substack. And I am thrilled to have my favorite American academic with us today, uh, Aaron Cariotti, MD, um, who is involved in, I think, what is a truly landmark First Amendment case that's working its way through a U.S. federal court right now. Aaron, I wonder because, and I, I, you may think I was just being flattering, but in fact, you are my favorite American. Thanks, actor. John. He, um, he's not only um, a has demonstrated great um, knowledge and cultivation as a professor of medicine. I've read many of his essays. He, he is a, I believe, a master of uh, American history and philosophy, and now he's involved in a legal dispute. Um, Aaron, would you mind telling our viewers, in case they don't already know who you are, could you introduce yourself, tell us about your background, how you got into this case, and then tell us about this landmark First Amendment case. Sure, sure, John. So, as you mentioned, I'm a physician. I specialize in psychiatry, and for most of my career, I was a professor of psychiatry and the director of medical ethics at the University of California, Irvine. That ended in uh, December of 2021, after I had challenged the university's vaccine mandate in federal court. And one way to go sideways with your employer quickly is to is to uh, you know sue them in federal federal court. Uh, the university ended up firing me after that for alleged non-compliance with the same mandate that I was challenging legally. And since then, I am now in private practice in Southern California, and I work with some independent research institutes like the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C., the Brownstone Institute, and the Zephyr Institute out here in California. And my focus is continues to be on medical ethics and public policy. Uh, and right now, my main focus, I would say, which has sort of shifted since uh, the end of COVID. During COVID, I was very much focused on pandemic-related policies, advocating for the right of informed consent and the right of informed refusal, so challenging vaccine mandates and other authoritarian policies, other policies that prove to do more harm than good, things like lockdowns and school closures. I was a vocal critic of during the pandemic. and. <clears throat> In the last, I would say, year, my shift has folk, uh, my, my, my focus has shifted to advocating and fighting for not only sort of medical freedoms, but particularly medical freedoms in the context of the freedom of speech. So I have two other lawsuits in federal court, one here in California called Hogue v. Newsom, which is challenging Assembly Bill 2098, which was a gag order on physicians, essentially saying that the medical board could punish you, including potentially removing your license to practice medicine, if you contradicted what the law called the current scientific consensus on COVID, which is a concept very ill-defined in the law, I think deliberately vague concept that would basically have weaponized the medical board against any physicians who challenged policies that the state government or the State Department of Health did not, uh, you know, did not want to have challenged. That is a case that's going well. We were awarded an injunction that basically halted the law while the case is being tried. But the early indications are that we're going to prevail and that law is going to be struck down as unconstitutional. The second case, and probably the one you're thinking of, the, the, what will probably turn out to be a more consequential case, is a case called Missouri v. Biden. And I'm also a plaintiff. I'm one of five private plaintiffs in that suit that was originally filed by the state attorney general of Missouri and the state attorney general of Louisiana. And what we're alleging in this case is that the federal government, including more than a dozen federal agencies and many dozens of federal employees and workers, have been colluding with, pressuring, coercing, strong arming, jawboning social media companies to do their bidding and basically to censor the views of Americans that would challenge the government's preferred policies or preferred narratives. And initially, when we first filed the lawsuit, 
the plaintiffs were very much focused on the censorship that happened during COVID. So two of my other co-plaintiffs, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford, Dr. Martin Koldor, formerly of Harvard, were censored during the pandemic for our dissident views related to lockdown, school closures, vaccine mandates. And <clears throat> so that, that was the original sort of intent of the lawsuit was to, was to take a look at the, what we're alleging is unconstitutional violation of First Amendment rights, specifically in regards to those who were challenging the government's COVID policies. But as, as that case has proceeded, and as we've gotten more and more documents on discovery, communications between these federal agents or the federal agencies and the social media companies, what we've realized is that the censorship actually has gone far beyond just pandemic related policies or COVID related issues. So we've seen the government pressuring social media companies to censor on all kinds of contested and disputed issues in American public life, everything from gender ideology to abortion, to uh, questions about climate change, to our withdrawal from Afghanistan. So foreign policy issues. The uh, House Judiciary Committee just last week issued a report basically showing that the FBI was pressuring social media companies and sending them censorship requests and or censorship demands, not only from our own federal government, but actually they were working on behalf also of the Ukrainian intelligence agency, the Ukrainian version of the CIA was forwarding their own censorship requests to the FBI. And the FBI was forwarding those to social media companies claiming that these accounts that they wanted taken down were uh, basically Russian agents, Russian disinformation. Uh, but we now know that many of the accounts that were censored were actually American citizens. One of the accounts that was censor censored was actually a State Department account. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's, re there's reason to believe that that Ukrainian intelligence agency has been actually infiltrated by Russian agents. So it's possible that those requests to the FBI were coming from not Ukrainian intelligence agents, but Russian intelligence agents, regardless of, you know, one or the other, we've seen basically Americans First Amendment free speech rights being violated, not only by our own government, but our own government on behalf of foreign governments, you know, their, their criteria, according to one high level official in that Ukrainian intelligence agency, their criteria, well, how do we know what's true and what's false, what's misinformation? And he basically said, well, we should interpret it broadly as basically anything that might undermine, you know, our efforts in this war. So any, anything that, you know, our government or our country or our side of this conflict, you know, would not like, regardless of whether it's true or false. So, you know, this is, there's one more piece of evidence on top of the evidence that we've uncovered in discovery that this kind of unconstitutional illegal activity has become so routine actually in our federal agencies and among many senior federal officials, um, both in health and human services, kind of public health agencies like the CDC has been involved in this, but um, but we've seen censorship from the intelligence agencies, from the FBI, uh, from the Department of Defense. We've seen the, you know, of all things, the Censorship Bureau was involved in censoring uh, election related uh, content. Uh, the uh, there, there were two things that I heard you say in an interview you gave with Dr. Peter McCullough that I thought were just astonishing. Well, there were three. I think you mentioned that it was the Census Bureau. Yeah. Um, I think someone concerned about Federal Reserve policy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The the Treasury Department. Um, well, you and, know, then was... one, and then one more, because I want <laughs> I want to just get your your general thoughts about this. My favorite. I just thought this was priceless. There is a federal bureaucrat who expressed concern with the protection and maintenance of our cognitive mm. structure. Right, right. That came from a woman named Jen Easterly, who has been the director of CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, which is one of our 434 federal agencies. I think most Americans don't realize how large the administrative state 
is, you know, a well-informed American could maybe name a dozen federal agencies. Okay, we got the FBI and the CIA and NIH and, you know, six or eight more could probably come to mind. But yeah, 434, most of which the average American doesn't know the name of. And this is, this is one of those little known agencies that was stood up in the waning days of the Obama administration in 2016. And their, their remit, their, their mandate or their purpose was supposed to protect our digital and other critical infrastructure from uh, cyber attacks, from you know, people who might want to blow up the electrical grid somehow, or you know, do uh, sabotaging uh, related behaviors that would disrupt our critical communications and well, in 2017, SISA decided that protecting our elections was part of our critical infrastructure. And they interpreted that very broadly to include what Jen Easterly called our cognitive infrastructure. We need to protect our cognitive infrastructure from external threats. And, you know, our listeners may be wondering, well, what, what is our cognitive infrastructure? Our cognitive infrastructure, John, is the thoughts inside of your head and the thoughts inside the heads of our listeners. And of course, these have to be protected from, guess what, from bad ideas that might, you know, put, implant bad notions in your mind and, you know, cause you to make the wrong decisions in an election, let's say. And all of this started growing up around 2017 and, and shifting an agency like SISA from protecting us against cyber attacks or, you know, someone who wanted to blow up a bridge to censorship basically, which is what they mean by protecting our cognitive in infrastructure is, is by censoring information that they deem to be dangerous. And 2017 is no accident in terms of the birth of this whole censorship enterprise, because two things happened in 2016 that our ruling class elites, I, I would argue in, in both parties for the most part, did not expect and did not like. The first was the election of Donald Trump. And the second in Great Britain was the Brexit vote for the UK to exit the European Union. So our ruling elites basically decided after that, you know, rather than examine some of their core assumptions that were driving their policies that maybe were causing a very significant disconnect with the people that they were supposed to be ruling, rather than kind of examining what happened and why they got so many things wrong and, you know, uh, why the people shocked us by, <laughs> you know, voting this way. They said, well, democracy is all fine and well. Uh, you know, we're all for democracy, but democracy has to be protected from populist movements like this that are, that are dangerous and that result in bad outcomes like Trump or Brexit. So we have this weird irony where the so-called defenders of democracy have to protect, uh, you know, the word democracy comes from the Greek demos, meaning the people, and the word populist comes from the Latin populos, which means the people. So we have, we have the, we have the democracy that has to be protected from the, the people. Um, and because the people are unruly and they do, they, they do wrongheaded things like, uh, you know, make these kinds of decisions if we allow them uh, to vote without basically telling them what to think. So the way to protect democracy, the demos from the, the, the people, the populace, is through the control of the flow of information. And I think that's the genesis of the sort of contemporary version of the what I call the censorship Leviathan. And so this began to grow around 2017, but then it accelerated massively during the pandemic. Because after all, you know, now misinformation is so dangerous that people can literally die, right? If they get the wrong ideas in their head, if they they listen to people like RFK Jr. or Peter McCullough or John Leake or Aaron Cariotti, then, you know, they may make the wrong decision about wearing a mask or taking a vaccine or, you know, treating or protecting themselves from COVID. And so that became the pretense for a huge expansion of the censorship apparatus that had already been kind of picking up some steam for a few a few years and now it's just grown to these massive proportions where we see what i described earlier in the show is ba basically you know everyone and their brother who works for the federal government getting in on the game and deciding well 
you know, I work for the Department of Treasury and I don't like people on social media criticizing our monetary policy. So we need to stamp out that form of disinformation. And, you know, I could pick up the phone and call someone at Facebook and Twitter and get them to do my bidding because after all, we're the federal government, we carry a big stick and these companies, you know, more than anything, they fear the power of regulation to make their lives difficult. So I remember when um, these revelations were coming out, the so-called Twitter files, yeah. uh, one of the first things I, I thought was, it's an old sort of saying in law enforcement that you know by the time you catch a criminal that's involved in really sophisticated fraud, by the time you catch him for that offense, he's probably gotten away with about 50 before he actually got caught. And that's what right. we see is there's a sort of, hubris and 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 um arrogance that's you know the, the guy begins to think he can't be caught and so what you know you start seeing these revelations with the twitter files and then looking at what you guys have done as plaintiffs against the biden administration you do get the feeling these federal agencies have been having a censorship party for some time i mean that's exactly right you and look at this and you just think, oh, my God, like I've just arrived at like an orgy. Yeah, and, that's right. Know, what have yeah, I we're very we're very late for the party. And it's been it's been um, yeah, they've been tearing things up for, you know, hours and hours and hours before we even heard about the party. And in fact, some of the internal communications from SISA and the other agencies suggested that many of the people involved knew that what they were doing was illegal. Like they would say things like it's only a matter of time before people start asking questions about, you know, our, all of our activities related to so-called misinformation. So you almost get the sense that, um, you know, they were like teenagers having a huge party, but knowing that mom and dad are going to get home from their trip abroad and they're going to have a look around the living room and wonder what happened. So, um, you know, that might happen today, that might happen tomorrow, but you know, eventually we're going to be found out here. So let's kind of do as much of this as we can for as long as we can, uh, you know, until basically we're forced to stop. And we we hope that this lawsuit will be the first breach in the wall, and it should be the first of hopefully many lawsuits uh, that will begin to hold the people responsible for this censorship uh, accountable and liable in some way for the massive damage that they've caused. Well, let's let's jump into the state of Missouri at all versus Joseph R. Biden Jr. at all. Can you, because people are hearing little snippets of this, yeah. and, then, and then there was um, uh, a ruling that was issued on the 4th of July and uh, auspiciously. Um, tell us about this case. Yeah. So on July 4th, uh, the judge issued a ruling on a request that we had made to the court. So two two big things have happened so far in this case, uh, which has not yet reached the trial phase. We're still in the pre-trial phase of, of what's called discovery or limited discovery, where we can subpoena information, written records mostly. We can depose uh, defendants on their side. So this case got a little bit of media attention uh, last around last Thanksgiving when we deposed Anthony Fauci, because that was the first time that Fauci had to answer some really pointed questions under oath with the threat of the penalty of perjury. The two big things that happened were, were one, that government asked the court to dismiss the case, and they made arguments that the plaintiffs lacked standing. They made arguments, I'm not going to get down into the weeds on the legalities of this, but they made an argument related to something called qualified immunity, trying to show that basically we couldn't challenge the federal government in the way that we were. And the judge, uh, the judge sided with the plaintiffs on that motion to dismiss. In other words, he did not dismiss the case. He found that all of the plaintiffs, both the two states and the five private plaintiffs, did have standing to bring the case, and that the, the notion of qualified immunity did not apply to federal government officials in this case because the Constitution is the highest law of the land, and this is this is a claim that they are violating. Uh, the highest law of the land, and the, the court has to ap apply the highest level of scrutiny to a constitutional claim, so-called strict scrutiny, uh, meaning they don't defer to the defendant automatically. And every American from the president on down is bound to 
follow and uphold the Constitution. So there's no there's no immunity that would protect the government from this kind of challenge. The second big thing that happened in this case, which is what happened on July 4th, was that the court responded to a request that we had made for what's called a preliminary injunction. A preliminary injunction is not a final ruling in the case. It is before the case goes to trial, we, we, we petition the court saying, the evidence that we have presented to you so far, just the written evidence, the declarations from the plaintiffs, the, the initial document known as a complaint, basically outlining the evidence that we have for the government's uh, First Amendment violations. We believe this evidence is so overwhelming that just looking at this evidence, even before the case goes to trial, uh, the court should intervene to put a stop to this illegal activity that's happening because the trial could take months to even years. Most court observers think that Missouri v. Biden is eventually going to end up in the Supreme Court. That's gonna take a long time. And in the meantime, allowing this government censorship machinery to continue running means that Americans' constitutional rights are going to continue being violated until this case is finally, finally settled. So a preliminary injunction is basically the court saying, um, and this is hard to get, by the way, uh, the court might decline a preliminary injunction, but still side with the plaintiffs at the end of the day in the final ruling. But this is the court saying, and the judge did say on July 4th, we think the plaintiffs have a high likelihood of succeeding on the merits of the arguments that they've made. And so the court's going to step in right now and tell the federal government, you are on notice and you are not to do A, B, C, and D. Um, or if you do those things, that information can be subpoenaed and you could be held in contempt of court, which is not just a, a civil liability, but a potential criminal liability. So it's a, it's a very, very serious warning shot across the bow that would be sobering, I think, to any government official who is involved in censorship. And that's exactly what the judge did on July 4th. He granted our request for a preliminary injunction. And he outlined very carefully the activities that the government was and was not permitted to engage in in relation to social media companies and the things that they are permitted to do were very clearly based on uh, the the narrowly defined exceptions to free speech that have been articulated by the courts over the years so the freedom of speech the first amendment right does not apply to things like obscenity does not apply to child pornography does not apply to other various forms of illegal activity Direct incitement to physical violence is not a constitutionally protected right. It's not considered to be a free speech right. So the government is permitted to intervene with social media companies on all of those things that are not First Amendment protected. But the court said, you're, but you're not allowed to do that on every, basically every other form of speech. So that got everyone's attention. I think so far the media has largely ignored Missouri v. Biden They've made, maybe painted it as uh, just sort of a partisan issue. You know, there's some Republican attorney generals that are going after a you know, Democratic administration. Uh, but once this ruling came out, it was impossible for the New York Times and the Washington Post to continue ignoring the case. So that did get some media attention. The government responded immediately by appealing that injunction decision. And they requested the district court judge put a stay on the injunction, meaning don't implement the injunction uh, until the Fifth Circuit, the appellate court, can make a ruling on the appeal. The district court denied the stay. They, the district court judge denied that request, but the Fifth Circuit did put what they called an administrative stay on the injunction, meaning we're going to expedite the appeal process. It's going to take a few weeks. And so for now, we're going to put a hold on the injunction until we can consider the appeal process. Some people mistakenly interpreted that to mean that the injunction was overturned on appeal. The injunction has not been overturned on appeal. It's just not been implemented until the appeal uh, is heard. The, the administrative stay is the basically the Fifth Circuit saying we're just going to hit the pause button but we haven't considered any of the evidence yet so it's it's not a referendum on the on the merits of the injunction it's not the fifth circuit judges saying 
you know, we're probably going to overturn this. Uh, it's more of a procedural issue. So that's where we're at now. We should get a ruling uh, sometime, hopefully in the next few weeks, about whether the Fifth Circuit is going to uphold or um, somehow modify in some way or strike down that preliminary injunction. Regardless of what happens with that, then the case will go to the trial phase. You, it's... Or, or <laughs> we could also, we or they could also appeal the Fifth Circuit injunction ruling to the Supreme Court. So that, you know, the, the case is going to grind slowly because we haven't even gotten to the trial phase yet where there's testimony and examination and cross-examination and all the, the back and forth adversarial fact-finding process that you get with a, with a trial. Um, we're still in the preliminary phase of submitting written evidence, uh, taking depositions, and now arguing over this, uh, the, the preliminary injunction question. So what are the implications of this preliminary injunction, this, this subsequent ruling by the, uh, it's the Fifth Circuit that came in? Yeah. And, I mean, does that, pardon me if this is an obtuse question, but, but does that, would that seem to, could it be interpreted as a green light for these federal agencies to resume? So I think it could be. Um, it's not going to last very long. I mean, they, they've, they're doing an expedited hearing, so it could change again in a few weeks. I think the federal agencies are still going to be very reluctant to do that because the injunction may be upheld at the Fifth Circuit, right? Or it may be upheld by the Supreme Court if we end up with another appeal. And while the case is being tried, every federal, federal official knows that if I communicate with social media companies, that information could be subpoenaed in this case and then add to the evidentiary record of the kind of behavior that's being challenged. And if the injunction is upheld, uh, that could basically paint the defense in a very bad light that you know we're continuing to engage in this kind of behavior in a start-stop fashion, depending on what the court is doing. And if they want to claim that they're not violating the Constitution, um, you know, that that may that may paint them into a corner a little bit. So I think the injunction has already had an effect. I think everyone in the federal government is now on notice that, OK, this thing may not go our way. And so we're going to have to be really careful. I think they're probably scrambling now to take a look at those exceptions that are not protected First Amendment speech and figure out how broadly can we spin or interpret these things to kind of do as much of, of the kind of thing that we want to do as possible. So yeah, are, is the censorship industry going to sort of fold up shop and, and go home? No, it's, it's not, it's not gonna go down without a fight. But I think right now they're probably scrambling to figure out what are the loopholes? What are the workarounds? What do we have to kind of stop doing and what might we be able to continue doing maybe under a different pretense that would be my best guess as to the state of play right now on the other end you know i ultimately want to talk with you as a psychiatrist about you know what could be possible motives for this conduct not not only in terms of commercial motives, motives in terms of extending power and this kind of thing, but a broader question of why our people um, seem to have been lulled into this, yeah. uh, what I think is a sort of false logic of, of accepting that the government needs to be in the business of limiting free speech. But I, I wanted to, you mentioned this famous landmark ruling by a justice, I think Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the, the, uh, the, the Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. wrote the, the opinion, um, I think it was Schenck versus the United States, it's a famous 1913 case. And I think it's primarily remembered today because of Justice Holmes's rhetorical formulation, the government doesn't really have a right to infringe or to restrict free speech unless the state can prove that there is a real and present or a clear, excuse me, unless the state can prove there is a clear and present danger yeah. to public safety. 
And do you understand what, what is the origin of this idea that the adult responsible citizenry of the United States is just under constant danger of being misled in such a way that the citizenry needs to be protected from itself. Yeah. Can you kind of trace this back as sort of archaeology of this? So free speech um, is the, the historical exception rather than the rule. Our constitutionally protected right of free speech is not the norm throughout human history. Every regime in power has always been interested in controlling the flow of information and in uh, influencing what the population that they're ruling thinks. Uh, I, I think that's a, just a perennial inclination, temptation, if you will, of power uh, as a way of solidifying power, as a way of uh, protecting oneself against any challenges to my power or my policies. It's, it's a natural human inclination that our founding fathers understood uh, had to be rein, reined in with a very, very strong legal framework because you know even a virtuous leader is going to be inclined to think that he or she knows best for everyone else and to try to challenge opposition by getting them to shut up, which is what most regimes have done throughout most of human history. But what we were trying to be an exception to. So we have very strong First Amendment free speech uh, protections in this country precisely because um, it, it, the, the desire to censor is always going to be there and it's always going to fly under the banner of what's best for the population, of health and safety especially, you know, preventing some disastrous outcome from happening. And, uh, and we saw that, of course, during COVID in spades, that health and safety proved to be a very strong fulcrum for this, this lever of you know, increased government emergency powers and you know, a widespread exception, uh, you know, acceptance of a censorship regime. So recognizing that, um, that health and safety and any, basically any justification for censorship at some level is always going to be a pretense because ultimately censorship is about controlling what people think and, and solidifying one's power and defending one's power against uh, adversaries or against challenge, yes, against I, dissidents. I, I, I think that this is what the founding fathers understood that, that we, in a way we're a victim of our own success as our society has become more and more secure and life expectancy and, and medicine and all of these things that have protected us from dangers. As that over time has improved and our security has increased, we've lost sight of something that I think the founding fathers understood, which is there's always some kind of threat. I mean, sure. you know, we're, yep. we're mortal. I mean, in their day, it was while well, the French are attacking or the Indians are attacking, or there's Barbary pirates or Caribbean pirates or, or whoever, there's the Spanish are attacking. There's always some threat. And if the executive can always step in at every moment and say, I'm suspending the rules because of this extraordinarily yep. dangerous situation. And I can't tolerate any smart ass who's sort of questioning me, then well, I mean, the free condition of our people is not going to last very long. Our founding fathers understood that we seem to have lost sight of it. And I wonder as a professor of psychiatry, in Orange County, California, you do seem to be an outlier. I mean, did you find any support for your endeavors in the early days of this? I found plenty of support from a, a lot of people all over the place. The people that I worked closely with, a few of them supported me, but, but most of them sort of went along with the herd mentality, went along with the don't ask questions, don't challenge. Uh, the authorities, you know, who are you to say that the CDC or the California Department of Health doesn't know what they're talking about on this or that issue? And I think that's a natural human 
inclination. I think there is, um, you know, one of the ways in which elites throughout history have always augmented their power is through, you know, the, the, the cultivation, sometimes deliberate or sometimes just passively allowing a problem to develop so that they can propose a solution to it. So back in the days when we had three network news channels that could more or less control the flow of information um, because they were the only places that you could go for information, I think it was easier for Americans to feel mostly confident that we had a shared repository of facts and information that we could more or less trust. Whether or not that was true, whether or not those networks were telling the truth about these issues is another question. But psychologically, I think people had a little more sense of security. And today there's a lot of uncertainty. And you, you talk to people all the time that will say, I just, I don't know who to trust. I don't know where to get my information. You know, you go online and it's just a, a fire hose of opinions and information and data that most people feel ill-equipped to sort through. And so people want shortcuts. They want shorthand. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not able to digest all of this. And I'll be the first to say that that's a very real challenge. It's a very real psychological difficulty for most people. But let's be very, very aware of the censorship solution. The censorship solution looks attractive because it says, well, just tr trust the government. They're going to have your best interests in mind or trust these experts, the kind of technocratic mentality where we have a cohort of experts that either work for government agencies or work at a place like the CDC. And, you know, they're going to be objective and neutral and they're going to figure out what's best. And then they're going to sort of tell us what to do. Uh, that's that's a fool's goal. That's a I, I think that's a solution to the difficulty of sorting through complicated information that um, that in the end is going to do far more harm than good, because it's basically empowering a group of people, no matter how wise or intelligent they might be, to be the final arbiters of truth. And what the founding fathers recognized is that all of us have to have the intellectual humility to recognize, first of all, you know, the, the government and various institutions are always going to have their own institutional biases, their own, their own interests at work. Um, and second of all, no, none of us is God. None of us has the omniscience to discern the truth or falsity of every single contested question in American public life or every single complex question that, you know, scientific inquiry is trying to answer. So as messy as it is and as confusing and complicated as it often might be, the best solution is to let every voice be heard and trust the rationality, trust the, uh, trust the, the hive mind, if you will, trust the, the basic um, intuition that most Americans most of the time are gonna be able to sort through the cacophony of information, hopefully come to, uh, if not the best solutions, at least, um, at least avoiding maybe some of the worst solutions or the worst proposals, that the way to correct uh, false information or bad ideas is through reasoned argument and debate and letting, letting everyone basically have their say uh, and then people can use their own wits and their own judgment to discern, yeah, this person is credible and they have the experience uh, or they're making the case in a way that's most compelling. And um, and so I'm going to choose to to trust them as a as, you know, potentially reliable source of information on A, B, C or D. That solution um, may not give us the sense of psychological security that um you know if i just trust whatever the cdc says or whatever the state government says uh i'm going to be okay but i think the only alternative to that is really a form of at the end of the day it's a form of totalitarianism that's what totalitarian regimes do that's the starting point of all totalitarian regimes there's a 20th century political theorist named eric Vogelin who studied the totalitarianisms of the last century and he said that the, the common feature and really the starting point of all these various totalitarian systems from Nazism to communism to Italian fascism is not concentration camps or secret police, you know, men in jackboots or mass surveillance, as, as bad as all those things are. So the common feature of all totalitarian systems is the prohibition of questions, right? the inability to pose and ask certain questions that may challenge 
the status quo or may challenge conventional thinking or may challenge what the ruling class wants you to believe is where totalitarian regimes always start. They monopolize what counts as rationality. They monopolize what counts as publicly acceptable knowledge. And if you try to contradict that, they don't, they don't sit down and debate with you. They don't argue with you, right? The, you know, the, the Marxist in a communist society, um, if you challenge the idea of class conflict and the coming of the proletarian revolution, they're not, you know, they're not going to get on TV and debate you. They're just going to say you're infected with a bourgeois false consciousness. You know, you're, you're kind of, you're mentally defective by definition. And so, you know, we're just going to place you outside the realm of rational conversation. If you continue to insist on your point, we're just going to steamroll you, right? That's censorship. Yes. That's what happened during COVID. Yes. And, and this, in this strange thing that you see documented, uh, for example, in the, in the former Eastern Bloc in Soviet days and the dark winter of Soviet days in places like Czechoslovakia. I, I studied with a British professor named Roger Scruton and he- Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm familiar with Scruton's work. Very, yeah, very fine intellectual. He wrote a book called Notes from the Underground and it's sort of loosely based on his adventures smuggling Samizdat into the Czech yeah. Czechoslovakia yeah. in, in the 80s. And he has this wonderful scene in the novel where he talks about walking the streets of Prague circa 1982. And it's like everybody's face, their affect is sort of a mask, sort of looking straight ahead. And it's, it's like this protective mechanism. No one yeah. is going to let anyone else know how they feel and think. And we all, even though we all know that behind our mask, we are thinking in question, uh -huh. yeah. we can't show it. So it's this amazingly schizophrenic. Yeah, thing. there's there's a false reality that everyone knows at some level is a false reality, but no one feels they can say it. And this this goes back to, um, you know, it, it, Hannah Arendt, who, as you probably know, also very carefully studied the origins of totalitarianism. And, and she says, basically, she draws this distinction between a totalitarian regime and a dictatorship. We often use those words interchangeably. She says in a dictatorship, they're, they're, they're actually different. That a dictatorship, people conform because of external threats, right? They're afraid that the ruler is going to come down on them and punish them if they don't comply or if they don't keep their mouth shut or if they don't go along with the program. In totalitarian regimes, you have a lot of that initially, the external coercion, right? the concentration camps, the lock you up if you don't comply. But as the system progresses in a perfect totalitarian system, you don't need those things anymore. You don't need the mass surveillance because people start surveilling one another. Right? Neighbor starts surveilling neighbor and will turn them in if they step out of line. You don't need the concentration camps and the secret police anymore because the ideology has become so internalized that people, that, that the questions, the challenges simply no longer occur to people. And she says, that's the worst form of imprisonment. Like in a concentration camp, you can at least still have your own thoughts. But, but when this becomes so habitual, right, that you've internalized the ideology or at least internalized the idea that I can't question anything that's going on, even, even if deep in my gut, I know that something is wrong, right? That I'm not, I'm not permitted, I'm not allowed to challenge it. And those questions no longer occur to you. Then you're really in a prison that you can't escape from. Yeah, I was shocked, and I, I suspect that you were as well. During the early days of the pandemic, I mean, by the time we get to the end of March 2020, how quickly Hannah Arendt's concept seemed to already be yeah. at play, kind of at an incipient stage. It, it's like, holy smokes, it only took three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would have thought, you know, we'd need some Gestapo running around with German shepherds for just a little while um, yeah. before we, you know, get into this. Um, I mean, I think part of the problem with this, with the, let's start with the dictatorial censor is he kind of has a hard time 
making it clear to the public what exactly will be the harm if we mm -hmm. talk about things in a way that could be misleading you know maybe yeah. my neighbor at the barbecue says something that leads me to do something stupid well it's not exactly clear how stating dumb opinions or you, you know I, I don't i don't know behaving foolishly or in a way that is not fully 100 percent informed it's, it's not necessarily going to hurt anybody maybe people will make a fool of them fools of themselves maybe it will be minor accidents or something but how is allowing someone to speak in the public forum who might be in error, it's not always clear to the public that this is going to result in disaster. I think that where, where the dictatorial or even totalitarian aspiration, where, where it really had you know, all of the cards with COVID was, was this, this proposition, the vaccine. I have, yeah. you are all man, woman, child, athlete, nursing home, resident, you're all equally in mortal danger. And I have the panacea. So yeah. if you listen to any doctor who tells you not to take this, he could be resulting and listening to him could result in your direct harm, even your death. And, and I, so I think that mechanism offered the ultimate. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, it was it was again, it was a it was a near perfect fulcrum to try to make the case for shutting people up. But in retrospect, we can see now that what we were told about the vaccine was by and large, at least in many really important respects, false, right? We were misled on safety, we were misled on efficacy, which turned out to be very short lived, and you got diminishing returns with each new booster. Um, vaccine safety issues started to emerge and people who were pointing those out were silenced, uh, censored in many cases. And so this, this is a perfect example of in the moment, what people were telling you might have sounded compelling. Yes, you're literally going to die if you get a wrongheaded notion in, in your mind about the vaccine. So we can't take that risk because after all, lives are at stake. Right. But now in retrospect, we can see, oh, no. Yeah, the authorities are fallible. The authorities can be wrong. Uh, there could be a lot of other factors besides health and safety of the population at work and pushing this particular product in this particular way. And I mean, this is one of the reasons that, you know, when I challenged vaccine mandates uh, early on in the vaccine rollout process, I wasn't challenging them on the basis of concerns about safety and efficacy. I developed those concerns more later as I started seeing more and more data on the vaccines. But my initial challenge was just defending the doctrine of informed consent um, in principle, that where there's risk, there, there has to be choice for a competent adult. Um, we did know that the vaccines didn't stop infection and transmission. So if there were risks, they were going to accrue to the person making the decision to vaccinate or not vaccinate. If there were benefits, they were going to accrue to that individual. And so it, it needs to be that individual's choice. And I, I think that basic, that kind of basis of our civil liberties that involves a respect for freedom, even if freedom is, is kind of messy, is absolutely necessary. Yeah, people, people should be able to be wrong, right? If you could never conjecture about anything, if you could never hypothesize, if you could never wonder out loud, if you could never say something that later proved to be false, um, what kind of life would that be, right? Yes, and I think that's a very important point because, I mean, when when we're presented with something that seems to be novel, at, at, at any rate, most of us have had no experience with it before, including people who are purported authorities. I mean, we're in the learning phase. We're in the dis the discovery phase. So to just, so to just tell everyone. We've already established an orthodoxy about this, yeah. e even though we're still trying to learn about it. I mean, to me, it's it's just a way to quell, to squelch actually learning about it. I mean, if you say we already know anyone mm -hmm. who, who offers a different point of view just needs to shut up. To me, that's just a clear recipe to prevent 
real knowledge from from emerging. And with the vaccine, I mean, the problem that that, that the censors had with that is in the marketplace of ideas. To to quote uh, John Stuart Mills's um, formulation of this, there were a lot of people out there who were alert enough and had sufficient discernment to realize this just isn't really adding up. I mean, what yeah. the government, because if you think about it, if if COVID were truly lethal to everybody, including young athletes, that would have become apparent pretty quickly. I mean, you would have known a young athlete who- yeah. That's right. I um, so that wasn't happening. And then, you know, the idea, um, this thing is for sure going to protect you. I mean, the intuition there was, well, I mean, how do you know? I mean, this is a new product. You, you went through this exactly. kind of warp speed yeah. test. So th I think there was enough discernment in the marketplace of ideas to just wonder about this. Absolutely. But people were shut down for, for simply asking those entirely reasonable questions or, or making those entirely reasonable assumptions that obviously we don't know any of the long-term safety profile of this product because no one's taken it and then gone on to be observed long-term. So yeah, many of these things were could have been patently obvious to people and were obvious to many people who decided that they were gonna break ranks with that particular orthodoxy and, and dissent. I mean, this is an example of you know, science and censorship are totally incompatible. If you want to bring the scientific enterprise to a grinding halt, then try to implement censorship to defend certain scientific orthodoxies. Science advances by challenging what we think we know, by challenging scientific orthodoxies. I mean, Newtonian physics was scientific orthodoxy for literally hundreds of years, right? And seemed to be confirmed on every occasion where we, you know, where we tried to test uh, the Newtonian hypotheses. And it's hard to imagine a scientific theory that was more secure than Newton's, uh, than Newton's theory of motion uh, and his theory of gravity and so forth. And yet we later discovered because Einstein challenged it that, well, yeah, Newton's theory is only an approximation and it works for kind of mid-sized objects moving at pretty low speeds, but at object, very, very small objects, uh, it doesn't work and, and objects moving at very, very fast speeds, it doesn't work. And so we get the general theory of relativity, which really upends Newtonian science in important ways. And so nothing in science is absolutely and definitively settled for good and can never be challenged. And I think it's important, you know, anyone familiar with the history of science should understand this, that every single medical orthodoxy that we've had over the years has eventually been overturned or at least shown only to be partially true and not true in you know in every case and you know the germ theory of disease needs to be modified in some way to accommodate you know other phenomenon and so forth so particularly when you're dealing with something as complex as as biology the idea that you have a definitive orthodoxy on anything related to medicine that's going to apply to each and every person in every circumstance is yeah, kind so of crazy to me that's that that's the point i mean and partly it's a matter of, of definitions here but i mean i i would even go so far as to suggest that medicine is not a pure science it's it's too complex absolutely yeah there, there are too many variables you can't measure the body's response to a certain pathogen or to a certain external um, uh, force or threat or however you want to just describe the human organism in need of medicine. I mean, there's so much variation. There's so many variables. I mean, a lot of it, I think, you know, ultimately it can't be measured in the way of a rocket mm -hmm. flying through space. Um, and, and that, that, inability to precisely measure every single variable makes medicine in many ways as much of treating patients as much of an art uh, an observational art um it this seems to be working yeah. i can't tell you exactly why i mean we could have a whole conversation about how uh, randomized controlled trials seem to be perceived as something like, you know, Newtonian physics or, or the relativity theory, but, but maybe it's not quite that precise. Um, I think um, 
what is this this um, eminence at Stanford? John Ioannidis has yeah. written about how a lot of randomized controlled trials that everyone has thought for a long time were the you know the final word <laughs> can't be replicated. It can't be replicated. Yeah, the so-called replication crisis, which should should give us a dose of intellectual humility. Um, and we need to recognize that a, a clinical trial and the outcome of a, a clinical trial is also based on statistical averages. Um, you know, such and such a product is 10%, you know, effective against whatever. Well, that that's based on an average of, of a distribution of a bell curve. And there's outliers and there's people that to, for whom that 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 conclusion doesn't apply. So studies are all always about populations in general trends when you test something on a whole population of people. But medicine is about particulars. It's about this individual in front of me, which is why observation and clinical experience and uh, quite frankly, trial and error is always going to be a part of it. So the idea that we could dictate, um, you know, so-called evidence-based medicine based on statistical averages that we then apply to, to everyone rather than trying to personalize care is a wrongheaded way of imagining uh, the practice of medicine. Science yeah. also, just by its very nature, works and it has pragmatic utility very often because it simplifies complex things. It provides the germ theory of disease is not so much right or wrong as it is a simplified model of certain kinds of diseases that provides some helpful insights. But that's not the whole story of infectious disease, the whole story of infectious disease is vastly more complicated than that one sort of simplified model of infectious disease. So intellectual humility uh, about what we think we know, and certainly about what other people ought to do with what we think we know, uh, that's something that's really important to recover in science and medicine in general. It reminds me of um, an observation that your fellow psychiatrist Carl Jung made that he's talking about how modern medicine, and in, in many ways, modern rationality, I mean, you know, every bureau of statistics is trying to reduce a huge sample of human beings into statistical averages. And he gives the example, if you took a riverbed and there, you said that there were 10 million rocks composing the floor of the riverbed yeah. you could say that the average rock in this riverbed is six by six centimeters and, and weighs 0.8 pounds yep but you would be hard pressed to find a single single stone rock that, that matches that description that's match, right matches that yeah. statistical average yeah and it says that this is the thing that that modern man is is challenges us is we say, well, there are 360 million people in this damned country. You know, we have to make policy that in some way addresses this vast number. But as a doctor or as a psychiatrist, you have to examine that individual patient as an individuum, not as some exactly thing. Exactly. And uh, the, tr the tradition of Hippocratic medicine attempts to do just that, but this kind of technocratic, top-down, dictatorial form of medicine uh, treats everyone as though they are that that rock. When in fact, none of the individual rocks is is precisely like that. You're dealing with an abstraction rather than the concrete reality of the person in front of you. And I think that's a real danger right now uh, for medicine to be moving in in that direction and you know, misapplying our technologies in ways that end up doing more harm than good. And so our, going back to the issue of free speech and civil liberties, I think our founding fathers understood this and erred on the side of individual judgment and individual liberty, knowing that people would make bad decisions, sometimes that might harm their own health, and that people will say stupid things that, you know, are not true. But the alternative to that, the alternative is, you know, crowning an, a person or an agency or an institution with, uh, you know, with power to decide all these things on behalf of everyone is far worse than the, you know, the messy business of letting people make free judgments and doing our best to, um, you know, 
help people to get informed so that they can make judgments that are uh, that are sound. And, uh, you know, that's that's really hard. I mean, that's a risky proposition, but certainly our founding fathers thought it was worth the risk. And um, I tend to I tend to agree. Um, I'd, I'd rather have, you know, a messy constitutional republic with an unruly populace um, that makes some mistakes then I would, you know, want to live under a dictatorial regime that eventually turns totalitarian, where we all become robots to whom dissident questions no longer occur. Yes, I, I think that, that Madison's perception was that human affairs are always at, at any given time hemmed in by, by wolves. I mean, there's, there's yeah. dangerous people, there are dangerous things in nature. But we, we should never lose sight of the fact that what he called an overgrown executive, um, someone who's given executive power, that may well end up being the biggest wolf of all. That's right. Yeah. If it's not carefully limited. I mean, the point of the Constitution is not only to provide a, a legal framework to govern our society, it's also to govern our government. Government, yeah. The government. It's, it's, it's to raise it the, the Constitution is designed to rein in power, um, and it's designed to protect civil liberties, uh, mostly from harms from the government. <laughs> uh, you know, it's the the First Amendment doesn't apply to private actors. Um, it applies to the government. And it limits what the government can and can't do. And our jurisprudence since that Holmes decision early in the 20th century has has refined what that phrase, you know, sort of imminent danger means and has clarified that basically the, the criteria is direct inci incitement to physical violence is not protected First Amendment free speech. But these attempts to to interpret harm very broadly, we see a lot of that these days, right? Words themselves, aside from actions, are harmful. So we have to protect people from harmful words. No, that's not part of our constitutional jurisprudence. Direct incitement to violence. Me getting on Twitter and saying, I don't like John Leake. Uh, I think all of my followers should go to his house located at this address and try to burn it down. Okay. I don't have the constitutionally protected right to say that, but I do have the constitutionally protected right to say, this is not true, by the way. I don't like John Leake. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I think he's an idiot calling you, you know, names. You know, that might, that might be a stupid thing to do. It might be a wrongheaded thing to do. It might be a mean thing to do. I'm not saying it's virtuous, Some but the, the government can't step in and prevent me from doing that. Some of the time it might be true. I mean, and you, yeah, I mean, but, well, that's why you have to allow it, right? You right. know, maybe people need to know that their leaders, you know, are scoundrels. And if nobody can say that, uh, <laughs> that, then people are misinformed. Well, and if no one can criticize the leaders in their decision, then it's, it's probably going to result in leaders and decisions becoming hubristic and arrogant. Exactly. I mean, I mean, yeah. that, that's the thing that amazes me about what guys like you and, and Matt Taibbi and, and others who, Schellenberger, these guys that have studied this, this, this censorship industrial complex, just the arrogance of it. Yeah, yeah, that's what you see coming, seeping out of every pore is the, the contempt for the average American. You know, people are too stupid to know what's good for them. You, you let them off the leash and you get... Trump and Brexit and other things that, you know, are obviously dumb. Um, and, and furthermore, we know better, right? We know what's good for you. We know what's good for everyone. Uh, we're the enlightened ones. So this kind of, uh, this kind of elite technocratic contempt for uh, the, what, what should be the shared rationality of all human beings. Um, is something that I I find I just personally find disgusting. <laughs> Actually, I can't I can't stand it. Um, I think every American does matter. Um, I, I'm not big on credentialism, 
right? So yeah, I mean, I can, I can flout, I'm a physician, so therefore you should listen to me because I know what I'm talking about. But there's been so much of that nonsense in the last few years. I'm just sick and tired of it, honestly. And, you know, I really don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a physician or a historian or college graduate or whatever. You're a human being. You have life experiences. You've probably had to contend with certain hard realities and suffering. And so your voice deserves to be heard. And you might know, you probably do know some things that I don't know. So let me have the intellectual humility to, uh, to at least allow you a chance to say what you want to say, right? I might agree. I might not agree. You might be persuasive. You might not be persuasive. I think that's what our founding fathers imagined. Uh, they did not want an anointed class of um, credentialed, quote unquote, experts that knew what was best for everyone else and thereby governed through diktat and through decree and through censorship. It's not, it's not that there's no such thing as expertise. There is such a thing as expertise, right? Um, and so, yeah, take, take into account someone's credentials and someone's expertise. But what I try to tell people is don't outsource your rationality. Don't outsource your common sense, right? All of us should be experts in, you know, spotting a logical contradiction. So some so-called expert gets on TV uh, and tells you, you know, our new policy is that when, when you walk into the restaurant, you have to have the mask on. But as soon as you sit down at your table, you can take the mask off. And we're doing this for the sake of public health. You know, it's okay to scratch your head and to say, you know, I'm not an expert on viruses. I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist. So but that just doesn't make sense to me. That seems stupid and self-contradictory and nonsensical, right? So don't outsource your logic. Don't outsource your rationality and common sense. Um, and take, take the credentialism kind of argument, the argument from authority, which is the weakest form of argument. It is a form of argument, but it's the weakest form of argument. Take that argument with a big grain of salt and, and test the trustworthiness of people who claim to be expert and claim to know, thereby know what's best for everyone. Well, which reminds me, we're seeing this censorship industrial complex and, and the, the, a lot of the donors, um, the interests that are supporting it. They've set up these shops at our elite prestigious university. That's right. Harvard University has a, a, a department or a, a, mm -hmm. a department for studying internet and society. It's called the, the Berkman and something or other. I think Stanford. Stanford has, has the Stanford Internet Observatory. University of Washington is another big hub of this sort of thing. Yeah. So it's a sort of, it reminds me, you know, going back to the, the Reformation, you know, you, you have these sort of clerical you know, offices of the propaganda of the true faith, and then sort of, you know, everyone else. I mean, I'm thinking within the, the Roman Catholic versus yeah. Luther and, and these, these Protestant reformers. So sort of everyone else um, is, has, is in terrible error. Um, so we need this office for the propaganda of the true faith to, to correct the, the errors of of anyone that could be led astray and then and then furthermore um the the power to deem anyone who who veers from orthodoxy as a heretic you know punishable with with grave offenses um and i i wonder have you have you looked into these university censorship yeah shops? yeah I, I i have a little bit um and some of the other journalists you've mentioned have dug into it mike benz who's at the foundation for freedom online is another great researcher in this space who's helped kind of um, sort out and articulate the anatomy of what I call the anatomy of the censorship Leviathan. It's like, you know, we're the blind men filling the elephant. We're trying to figure out, you know, what does this beast look like overall and how does it work and what's connected to what? Uh, what I can say about these things, first of all, I, I consider these things to be quasi, I call them quasi private entities. And I, I put the qualifier in there, quasi private because most of them get government grants, right? So they're, they're largely or very significantly government funded. And a lot of the personnel, just like we see a kind of revolving door between industry, like big pharma, and some of the regulatory agencies that are meant to 
rein in and regulate that industry, the FDA and so forth. We see, see the same thing in the censorship industrial complex of it's all the same players. And this year, you know, the person might work for CISA, but, you know, next year when they come to the same censorship conference or planning meeting, they happen to work for the Atlantic Council or the Stanford Internet Observatory. And, you know, so so they're, they're quasi private because really and we have internal communications that we have submitted the court in our case too, basically showing that many government agencies were trying to outsource the censorship to these quasi private entered entities as a potential First Amendment workaround. Now, legally, that doesn't work because the government is not allowed to uh, outsource to other entities uh, things that it would be illegal for the government itself to do. That still constitutes what the court would consider state action, which would implicate the government in a First Amendment violation. Um, you know, if I hire a hitman to kill someone, well, the hitman is responsible for that murder, but I'm also legally, to some extent, responsible for that murder as well, right? They, they, well, I didn't pull the trigger is not a plausible criminal defense in a case like that. And it, it's the same thing with these kinds of quasi-private entities that are basically, they're basically stood up in order to do the government's bidding. The other thing to realize about th these um, agencies, whether they're, they're freestanding nonprofits or they're sort of these cutouts, um, you know, in the context of institutions of higher education that are government funded is when Schellenberger calls this the censorship industrial complex, the word industry and industrial should be taken literally. This, this whole thing is now grown up into an entire industry where there's full-time job opportunities, there's training programs, there's career advancement. I mean, this is a very sophisticated machinery that's now running itself that, you know, a, a college kid who's concerned about the problem of disinformation can decide he wants to go into the quote unquote disinformation uh, management industry, which is a euphemism for becoming, you know, a government sanctioned censor uh, and spend his time, you know, deciding what should and shouldn't be taken down in terms of things that Americans are posting online. So, Missouri v. Biden will hopefully be a breach in the wall, but it's going to take more than one court case or more than one precedent setting case to dismantle this whole um, complex, this whole Leviathan. And um, so it's it's also going to take maybe even more important than what happens in the courts of law is what happens in the court of public opinion. I mean, this this industry will be dismantled when enough Americans decide we don't want this and we don't want to live like this. We don't live in a country where the government is doing this. And so the conversation that we're having, I think is just as important as the conversation that, you know, our lawyers are going to be having when they make the arguments in front of the judge, because ultimately the, the will of the American people is going to have to, we, you know, first we're going to have to rediscover our love for the First Amendment if we've sort of forgotten why free speech is important. And then we have to demand that it be protected. And court cases are one way, one important way of doing that. I don't want to minimize the importance of a landmark legal case, but uh, legislative action, uh, congressional action, um, reining in uh, the executive branch so that these unelected bureaucrats and these administrative agencies um, don't have the kind of rulemaking power and unaccountable authority that they've been exercising over the last several years. This whole yeah. thing is going to be a big project, but I think okay. it's absolutely necessary. Uh, I, I, the... I, I think what you just said is that, you know, Americans, um, they need to, they need to rediscover their, their, it's like an old sweetheart that's been thrown out, you know, that's right. the curb. you know, we need to rediscover our love of the First Amendment. And I think children need to be educated in why we have it. You know, I was pleased to see in this opinion that was, or this rather, um, uh, uh, I guess you would call it an opinion, the ruling that was yeah, issued. The injunction ruling, yeah. Injunction ruling. Um, this um, this judge and this Louisiana Circuit Court, do you pronounce his name? Dodi Dowd? 
I, I've heard both. Uh, I think it's uh, Judge Doty, but I could be wrong about that. J Judge Doty, and he he sort of in his preamble, he 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 cites the First Amendment to the mm -hmm. U.S. Constitution and and James Madison and and uh, George Washington and these quaint figures. <laughs> <laughs> who uh hey you know, guys re remember this re remember these remember guys the yeah yeah and um so you know i was like well that's thrilling i mean I, the judge's opinion could be read by by um mm -hmm. high school students um absolutely so I, was, I was all revved up about this and then i saw a new york times op ed and i was so shocked to see that this assistant professor is a um as a professor in the law department at St. John's University, which I thought was this bastion of, of Western civilization. Liberal arts and West, yeah, great books, yeah. Right, right, well, there she is, and she kind of opens her salvo with, with ridiculing the judge for writing an opinion that reads more like a civics essay. So I'm thinking, well, maybe you, assistant professor, should consider going back and studying right. civics instead of right. pontificating about internet uh, right. censorship. So, you know, I, a philosopher like Hegel would say that the spirit of the First Amendment has sort of departed the body politic. <laughs> it's, sort of a, it's sort of just a formal thing. Yeah, yeah. But we, we need to reanimate the body yeah, that's politic right. with the spirit. Well, I, I can't thank you uh, enough for this. Um, and um, this is the uh, Kennedy Beacon. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running for president of the United States. I won't ask you to, to indicate your political sympathies, but yeah. um, I, I would like to state for our audience that um, uh, Mr. Kennedy is a First Amendment candidate. Um, I heard him in an interview um, just a few days ago um, with, I, I watch all of his interviews, so I don't remember, but he stated, if I'm elected, the first thing I'm going to do is issue an executive order prohibiting yeah. U.S. government agencies from outsourcing censorship to social media companies. And I, I, was, I was thrilled um, to see that. Um, and I, I thank you for sharing your expertise on the Kennedy Beacon, and I hope we can have another conversation at some point. I enjoy the conversation, John. And if I, if I could just say a word about um, Bobby Kennedy as well, I, I consider him a friend. Um, I have tremendous respect for him. Uh, he and I have political opinions that very much coincide on many issues. We have political opinions that uh, probably diverge on other issues. Um, but if I could just speak to, you know, the man's character, I, I think he's shown tremendous courage in being a dissident voice. Um, and sometimes dissident voices are right. Uh, sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they're partially right, but they're always important. Uh, it's always important to be able to challenge orthodoxies. And Kennedy has shown, I think, enormous courage in the face of kind of insane and often shrill and quite frankly stupid opposition that slanders him and misrepresents him i mean the latest anti-semitic uh you know slur against him was just a, a manifest attempt to uh, misrepresent what he had said that i quite frankly found disgusting but it's also been par for the course for kennedy i think the real reason that our establishment on the on the left and right in washington uh, fears Kennedy is that probably more than any other candidate, he is prepared and willing to challenge the power of the administrative state. And he recognizes the depth of corruption that has occurred in our intelligence agencies. And that, that goes back many decades, you know, to the, to the murder of his, his uncle and his father, arguably. Um, who also were concerned about the growing power of the intelligence agencies and, and may have been prepared to try to do something about that before they were before they were murdered. Um, and so I think that's the real reason they hate him. I don't think it has any I don't think it has much to do with vaccines. I think they've found that to be a useful bludgeon to try to discredit Kennedy. Um, but I think ultimately uh, the powers that be 
in Washington, particularly the unelected powers that be, the, the, the permanent administrative state. You know, deep state sounds sort of conspiratorial, but you know, what is the deep state? It's, it's, it's the behemoth administrative state, the 434 federal agencies, uh, and the individuals in those agencies that quite literally answer to nobody and are unaccountable to anyone who is, who is an elected official, including uh, even to the president of the United States. That's a real problem for democracy. And I think Kennedy recognizes that. And those who want to maintain those entrenched powers, I think rightly sense that among all the ca candidates, um, some are going to challenge their power more than others, but Kennedy probably um, is, is the biggest threat to uh, that per permanent bureaucracy. And my own view is I think that's why they are gunning for him so aggressively and, and you know, in many cases, so, so unfairly, just totally mischaracterizing his views on everything from, you know, vaccines to COVID to, uh, you know, his other efforts um, to advocate for uh, public health and, and safety against very, very powerful interests. When you push back against powerful interests, uh, they tend not to like it. And, and that's yeah, precisely I... one of the reasons that I, I think Ken Kennedy is such, a, such an impressive candidate and whatever happens with the election, he's at least bringing some of these issues to the fore uh, in the debates. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and I, we, we diverge in, in a number of uh, public policy opinions, but I think what's poignant about him um, is his willingness to be ostracized. Yeah. I mean, you, you would know this as a psychiatrist. It's, maybe it's kind of a cliche, but they say humans are most afraid of death and ostracism. That's um, right. That's right. I mean, it's very hard to stand out from the crowd. And most people don't have the spine or the fortitude to do it and, you know, agree with them or disagree with them on this or that issue. I think no one can doubt that Kennedy has been willing to do that for the things that he's convinced are right or true or good. Which is, uh, which is what makes him dangerous to right. the administrative state. Just you know, so. His father gave a speech um, at a university in Cape Town, and I want to say it was not long before his father was was murdered, um, in which he spoke about this, that if you look at history, um, most people are so frightened of being ostracized that, you know, they won't hold up their hand and, 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 and protest when they see something, an injustice being perpetrated. And so, you know, they're few and far between. Well, I, I thank you again, um, Dr. Cariotti, and I, I hope that we can uh, have another conversation. Thanks, John. I, I enjoy the conversation. Look, look forward to the next one. Excellent. Thank you.